Good afternoon and welcome to our 60th anniversary of Books Sandwiched In. Thank you all for being here for this uh, kickoff to our anniversary season. My name is Rebecca Foos with the Friends and Foundation of the Rochester Public Library. And the Friends of the Library have been doing these reviews since 1956. So it's certainly something to celebrate. A couple of things to uh, kind of bring this uh, a little extra special attention to today. I want to give a very brief uh, pop-up talk about the very first book that was reviewed in 1956. But before I do that, just a couple of program notes. If you haven't picked up a brochure about our spring season, I invite you to do so at the back table. This includes details about all our reviews, including next week's review, uh, Between the World and Me by ta Coates, and that'll be reviewed by Jim Shepard, who is our former uh, city police department chief and also now currently a Monroe County legislator. Also, just to bring to your attention, this Thursday, author Sonia Livingston, as part of Rochester Reads, will be here at noon in this very room, Kate Gleason Auditorium, to do a reading and book signing. And that's part of the Writers and Books uh, Rochester Reads series. So I invite you to both of those events. So with this being our 60th anniversary year, the committee has asked me to give a mini history of a book reviewed in our early seasons. And today I want to tell you about the very first book that was reviewed for Book Sandwiched In. On October 2nd, 1956, Dr. John Romano reviewed The Menninger Story by Walker Winslow. And yes, you still can get it at the Rochester Public Library. The Menninger Story was published also in 1956 by Doubleday, and it's the account of Dr. Charles F. Menninger and his sons, Carl and William, in creating, developing, and managing a famous psychiatric and educational institution, the Topeka Clinic, in 1919, which later moved to Houston. It was revolutionary psychiatric practice for its time, focusing on the overall health of patients physical, emotional, and social. We had a vision, Charles Menninger said, of a better kind of medicine and a better kind of world. The author of the Menninger story, Walker Winslow, was a friend of Charles Menninger. He became an alcoholic before he was 18 years old, and while in the army, Winslow began reading and writing. He lived a very transient life and spent some time in mental asylums due to his alcoholism. The conditions he saw in the institutions led him to take on jobs as a mental ward attendant at the Veterans Administration. Having seen the institutions from both sides, he worked as a lay therapist with alcoholics at the Menninger Clinic. He died in 1969. The local reviewer, Dr. John Romano, founded the Department of Psychiatry at the U of R in the 1940s. Does anyone remember the name, John Romano? He was distinguished professor and chairman there for 25 years. His major interest was teaching the relationship between medicine and psychiatry in illness and health. And to come full circle, which he wouldn't have known in 1956, in 1973 he received the William Menninger Award from the American College of Physicians. He died in 1994. So when you think about the treatment of mental illness in 1956, the Menninger story is quite remarkable. And I find it equally remarkable that the Rochester Public Library and the Friends of the Library took on this topic, which was most likely controversial and a little bit edgy. The Rochester Public Library was forward thinking then and remains so today as we provide a safe, trusted space to learn about challenging topics. We thank you for your past and future support to keep that happening. Now on to today's review. Our reviewer today of my life on the road is Mary Jane Curry, Associate Professor of Language Education at the Warner Graduate School of Education. She's also the founding director of the school's Writing Support Services, which offers students free individual consultations, ongoing <laughs> workshops, and occasional writing retreats. Since joining the Warner School faculty in 2003, Dr. Curry has taught courses in language education, literacy, and academic writing and publishing. 
Her doctoral seminars have focused on language and literacy across cultures and language, literacy, and globalization. She earned her bachelor's at Cornell, her master's at UMass Boston, and her PhD from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. She's researched and written extensively on teaching and learning English as a second language and on academic publishing. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Jane Curry. It's right there. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And thank you to the library for inviting me to review this book, My Life on the Road by Gloria Steinem. I know not everybody here has read the book, so um, I encourage you to do so. Uh, I'll start out by saying it's definitely worth reading. I know that many, if not all of you, have heard of Gloria Steinem in one way or another. Um, she's had a fascinating life. She's written a lot of books, so this is just kind of one slice of her life. Um, she is the same age as Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whose birthday is today, um, 83 years old. So here's Gloria Steinem. She looks pretty good. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is this year, but this is not that long ago. Okay, so before I discuss the book, though, let me say a little bit about myself. Um, when I was invited to review this book by um, my troublemaker friend, Gary Putup, who's sitting here, um, who's on the committee for the, the program, I thought, why me? Um, and it turns out they had seen my name on a list of affiliates at the Susan B. Anthony Institute at the University of Rochester. And I, I am an affiliate, but I'm not a scholar of feminism. I consider myself a feminist and a scholar, so I decided that I was okay, okay to do this. Um, and then as I read the book, I thought, okay, this actually fits pretty well because I've done a lot of traveling and I've been an, am continuing to be an activist and I've been a union organizer. I'm sort of a fellow troublemaker. Um, and I was definitely raised a feminist. I kind of think of myself as a two and a half wave feminist. Um, what did I want to say about this? I have a lot to say. Um, one, one of the slogans of the second wave feminist movement, which I'm sure many of you remember, is the personal is the political. And uh, I was trying to see if Gloria Steinem had actually created that slogan, and she said, no, it's sort of like World War II. Nobody can actually claim coining it. But we certainly would think of her as uh, somebody who embodied the personal as the political. Um, and, I, and I think it's something that if you're active in trying to make the world a better place, uh, it sort of comes naturally. So I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and I was raised by a, a feminist who took me and my two sisters to political rallies. And, and both of my parents always made me and my two sisters feel that we could do anything. This is a picture of my mom. She's Kay Oppenheimer. She's 77 years old. She's a retired lawyer and avid horsewoman. Still going strong. And um, when, when I was growing up, I remember because of her and her interest in, in politics, she had a political science master's degree. We used to go to political rallies. I remember uh, rallying for, remember the Equal Rights Amendment? Still don't have it. We could still be rallying for that. Um, women's reproductive rights, uh, political campaigns. We had Ms. Magazine in our house. The idea that you would grow up to be anything but a feminist was sort of anathema in my house. So I have sort of early feminist origins. Um, and my sisters and I have all turned out to be activists in one way or another. So I, I credit a lot of that to my mother. And, and um, we did some traveling when I was growing up, but I've done a lot of traveling since. So as I was reading the book, I could really make a lot of personal connections to it. So I, that's my disclaimer, is that I feel more personal, but that's okay, personal is political. Okay, so let's see about Gloria Steinem's life. This is a really brief biography that I kind of cobbled together from her website and other places, and I'm sure her actual resume would be about 50 pages long. Her website calls her a writer, lecturer, political activist, and feminist organizer, so I guess those are her core attributes. She went to Smith College, graduated in 1956, and then she spent two years in India on a Chester Bowles Fellowship, which I think was pretty impressive in the mid-50s for a, a young Smith graduate to just take off for India for a couple of years, and, and she was an, an organizer, women's organizer there. 
Um, and one of the things she talks a lot about in the book is how much she learned from the women that she organized uh, or helped to organize. Um, and I'll come back to that in a minute. She uh, came back and w worked as a journalist and, and had a lot of the same experiences that many women journalists had, especially at that time, but still continue to have in terms of being relegated to the soft news, to the women's issues, and anytime she wanted to do a political story, they would say, well, why don't you talk about Mrs. Nixon or somebody like that? So uh, she talks eloquently about sort of fighting to be allowed to report on real news. And as part of that, she was one of the co-founders of New York Magazine. Most famously, in terms of her journalism, she was a co-founder of Ms. Magazine, which I've already alluded to. Um, she also had a lot to do with um, political activism more broadly. Uh, she's well known for her work on women's reproductive health and reproductive rights. She co-founded the National Women's Political Caucus and co-founded the Women's Media Center. And she's been highly recognized. She was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame down the road in Seneca Falls. Um, Presidential Medal of Freedom, Freedom was awarded by Barack Obama, and then she just recently um, won the Eleanor Roosevelt Val Kill Medal, which I'm not even sure what that's for, but I'm sure it's good. <laughs> okay, so um, just to give you an overview of the book, it's seven chapters, it's very readable. Her writing is just so good. Um, she starts out, as many people do, who are writing about their life history, talking about her family. Her father um, was a heavy, heavy influence, but she also talks about understanding and witnessing the dynamics of her family and the way that her mother had to give up her career as a journalist. Um, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through these exactly one by one, but I'm going to touch on some of the major uh, points here. So uh, her early memories are of her, her father being an itinerant antique dealer. So they used to spend the summers in one, pl one place by a lake in Ohio. She was, grew up in Toledo. And then he would, he would go on the road selling antiques. It wasn't even really clear to me from the book how she went to school. But eventually, I mean, she went to Smith, so she obviously got an education somehow. Um, but she does talk really poignantly about how her mother uh, suffered from not really having a sense of a permanent home. And then she talks about um, what she got from this kind of nomadic lifestyle from her father, this real love of being on the road and seeing the world from many different perspectives. Um, and she also confesses to having this sense of embarrassment of coming from a very atypical family. I'm all hooked up here to walk around, but I guess the professor in me is just stuck behind the podium. Um, <clears throat> so she, she also uh, uses the book to advocate for all of us to get out and explore the United States. She talks about how much she's learned about our country just from getting on the road. Um, from an analytic perspective, she talks about the road as a masculine space, this sense of freedom and not having to be kind of tethered to domestic responsibilities. Um, but she points out that home is not necessarily as safe for women as people like to imagine that it is, that with domestic violence um, and sort of feelings of being trapped and contained that you know, we tend to romanticize the feelings of home and we also romanticize being on the road. And she, she, she explores that, that paradox or that tension very nicely. Her time in India, I think really, I think she was always interested in politics, but her two years in India really um, helped her understand the value of democratic participation in politics. And she was exposed to what she calls the portable community of talking circles um, that women's organizations were using in India to organize themselves. And she notes that those talking circles actually inspired Gandhi's methods. Um, one of the things she does nicely in this book in a couple of places is kind of digs a little bit deeper into some of the historical truisms that we take for granted. She talks much later, and I'll get to this at the end, about the Iroquois um, Confederacy and how that influenced the drafting of the U.S. Constitution. But that's one of those many facts, kind of not 
it's not necessarily lost to history, but it's not really mentioned that much. So people talk about Gandhi as sort you know, Gandhi was a great man, nonviolence, et cetera, but how often have you heard about the influence of the women's organizing um, movement in India on his political approach and his thinking? So this is, one of the neat things for the, about the book for me was just these little tidbits. Another thing I think is really um, powerful about the book is the way that she is, um, she's very honest in, in not a kind of show-offy way, but she talks about understanding in her time in India how much privilege she had as a white woman, as coming from a colonial power of the United States, that she just embodied that kind of privilege. And just to be on a kind of fellowship, which I mean, I've had some of those too, um, it's easy to ignore um, the kind of privilege that you're living when you have those kinds of experiences. But at the same time, she had this. She has this kind of witnessing eye, where she became aware, in every every experience that she had, of who was in the in group, who was in power, who was out. And in India, it really helped her understand how much women around the world are really the out group in terms of power and political decision making. This is. Um, Actually, my partner, Moritz, I thought he was going to be here today, but he probably forgot. But he, he witnessed me giving a talk a couple years ago. He's an engineer. And at the end, he said, you need more pictures in your talks. So I was very careful. I grabbed a bunch of pictures from the internet. It was really fun looking for these. So I thought, let's have some pictures of India in 1958. Well, I couldn't find, I didn't have time to dig deep enough to find Gloria Steinem in 1958, which would have been really cool. And it turns out, Life magazine had a cover in 1958 of an Indian woman and girl. So, um, you know, if you've seen movies about India, or maybe some of you have been to India, or pictures, um, you know, I don't know if it looks that different in many places now, but um, I think for the American public to see this picture in 1958, I would imagine uh, it's quite a contrast from what people were, were used to seeing. One of her chapters is actually dedicated to what she learned from public transportation um, in terms of not isolating yourself off in a car or a, a being driven by someone or um, well, I guess those are the main ways. She talks about the communal t travel that she experienced in India um, on trains and buses, etc. And as a, as a woman traveling alone in 1958, it was probably fairly unusual to see a white woman doing that. Um, she talks about how the community of women in India really took care of her on her travels. But she also uses her travels to ta expose multiple kinds of injustice that she saw, um, not only about women's role and place in society. Um, she talks about her experience helping flight attendants. Um, and if, if you remember flight attendants from the 50s, 60s, 70s, I found a great picture of this. <laughs> this was a Continental Airlines uniform from 1970. Can you imagine now asking flight attendants to wear this? But in those days, as some of you know, flight attendants had to be single and they had to be young. You get old, you get married, you gain a few pounds, you are out. Okay, now they have pretty powerful unions, but um, Gloria Steinem actually helped them in their um, organization and, and drive to resist this kind of gendered sexist oppression. Um, she also has some great stories about what she's learned from taxi drivers. And she talks about taxi drivers kind of being, you know, her ear on the ground of a lot of things. And she has a really nice, fairly long vignette about um, being at, in Cambridge, I think at, at Harvard or in Boston at a university and, and having missed the last plane home and having to travel somewhere else the next day from New York. And so they arranged a, um, car service for her and the driver used to be a trucker so she, obviously she talks to everybody she meets and the driver used to be a trucker and talked about what happens at truck stops which she'd never really experienced they stopped at every truck stop between Boston and New York and she really just got to see the kind of community of truckers and learn about um, you know women's women female trucker it was just really interesting but that's the kind of stuff that she always has an eye as a kind of journalist and feminist for kind of what's going on and she's clearly somebody who uh, would just engage with anybody that she comes along with. Okay, you're not going to forget that one in a hurry. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, so she spent a lot of time, she says she's been, she's probably done most of her speech giving and, and talking at college campuses. And uh, she, she's, she has really nice reflections on kind of her role. You get the sense that she's really not a prima donna. She's not there to get adulation or to have people look out for her. She's really there as an activist. She is there to make sure that she can leverage some kind of change. And what she says of her, her perceptions of her role, my job is to make their, the campus activists, work easier after I leave them than it was before I came. She said, it's already easy for me, because she's, she's, she's off to the next place. She's famous. I can also carry ideas from one campus to the next in the bee and flower model of organizing. So I love that image, the bee and flower model of organizing. So it's not just parachuting in, giving a talk, and taking off. She meets with students before and after. She talks about helping them with struggles on campuses, um, fighting, I mean, now we've just had these new regulations from Title IX coming through, which probably most of you don't need to know what Title IX, or you not, might know what Title IX is, but you don't need to know the administrative part of it. But all this stuff that's been happening in the past few years about sexual harassment on campus, um, the, the Title IX, the legislation, is now requiring uh, campuses to have real plans and training. We all had to do, all faculty and staff at the University of Rochester, which is, you know, 20,000 people, had to do uh, sexual harassment training last fall. Um, this was unthinkable when Steinem was organizing. So the idea that uh, these kinds of injustices are being recognized and addressed to the extent possible, um, I think she can take a lot of credit for, for the kind of consciousness raising that unfortunately has taken decades for this kind of action to happen, but it is happening. Um, she talks about, to some extent, about what we would call in academics the intersectionality of oppression, which is this, the idea that, you know, I'm not just a woman, I'm a white woman. Um, I'm, you're never just one person or one type, you don't have one identity. And so um, injustice, racism, discrimination against deaf people, people with disabilities, all these different isms and discriminations, they don't just happen to you in one aspect of your being, right? So uh, she, she tries to talk a lot about how she kind of put these pieces together. I, she has, there's a lot of great quotations. I was like a, like a freshman making all these notes of all these great quotes in the book. Um, I was posting a few of them on Facebook over the weekend when I was feverishly trying to finish the book. Um, but I like this one. Programs begun by a social justice movement are about changing the system to fit people, not the other way around. And our dominant system is so much about making kids or making people conform to what the institutions are looking for. And here she's just saying, no, that's just not right. What the institutions need to do is think about how to fit the people. So I love this. This was a realization she had. She writes about a visit to Gallaudet University in DC, which is a deaf um, university, very good university. Um, one of my very few criticisms of the book was that she jumps around a little bit chronologically, and so if you weren't alive or don't know about some of the history, you kind of have to try to figure it out. So I'm not 100% sure which campaign it was, but I think I figured out that it was the f 1956 Adelaide Stevenson presidential campaign, which would have been when she was finishing up in school, she volunteered. Um, and she that was sort of the beginning of her activism. Um, but right away, she noticed gender and race hierarchies of the staff, paid staff, and volunteers on the campaign that the white men were out front. They actually put the young women, when, when the media came around, they would sort of sequester the young women because they didn't, Adelaide Stevenson was divorced, which I hadn't realized, was, um, you know, they didn't want to have any hint of impropriety, so they would shunt the young white, with the, well, I think they were white, but the young women volunteers to a room upstairs. I mean, <laughs> it was incredible. Um, and at the time, they just thought, fine, whatever needs to be done will be done. There was no protest of it. Um, but one of the things she takes away from these experiences, I mean, she's, she's passionately fighting against them, but she's also kind of funny about them. But I thought this was another great quote. The clearest view is always from the bottom. And we know, we know this to be true, that uh, th there are uh, blinders that come with privilege, that privilege makes you unaware of what's happening in all these other domains. You probably don't care, 
but if you want to know what's going on, you look up from the bottom. So another strand that came through really clearly to me that I thought was quite interesting is that although she's an activist, she really stayed, wasn't comfortable. She said she was nervous speaking. She's nervous speaking her whole life, which is kind of amazing when you think about the hundreds, if not thousands of speeches she's given. Um, but she really sees herself as the reporter, the observer, um, the recorder, rather than as a candidate or a leader. And she says the great political leaders are energized by conflict. I'm energized by listening to people's stories and trying to figure out shared solutions. And I think for an organizer as opposed to a leader, these are really important characteristics <clears throat> to have. And, and, and we know that real change comes from the grassroots and real change comes from understanding people's realities. And you only understand people's realities by listening and not coming in on your high horse with solutions and, and exhortations. So I thought this was a really powerful lesson from the book. She also has a fabulous sense of humor. I don't know if anybody remembers the week that was. That was Gloria Steinem. She says, the power to make people laugh is also power. I love this, because I'm always cracking jokes at the wrong time, at work, especially at work. So um, people laugh, and it's like, oh, great. OK. Um, and, and also on organizing, she talks about her perspective that the job of the organizer is to kind of, I mean, we, we know this from journalism, kind of shine a light on the darkness. But I think it's more, almost more important that she's highlighting here. It's not just shining the light on the darkness, it's helping to people to understand what it's like to live in different conditions. She says, leave a dark basement and try to explain to people in the sunshine what it's like to live down there. In her last chapter, she talks about her deep friendship with Native American activist Wilma Mankiller, who's here, not a great picture, or scale. Um, and again, it kind of returns the book to her experience of listening and seeing societies that are more horizontally organized and not so hierarchical societies where women have an equal place. And she tells this story, which I alluded to earlier, um, about the US Constitution being taken, modeled on the Confederacy of the Iroquois and um, that Ben Franklin had, I had never heard of that. You usually hear about Ben Franklin uh, passing off blankets with smallpox. You never know which side, which story's right here. Um, ben Franklin inviting two Iroquois men to help draft the US Constitution. They went to Philadelphia and they said, where are the women? So I think, you know, this could have been the title of her book, you know, where are the women? Because that's really what she's asking all the time. Not just where are the women, but why do women not have an equal seat at the table? And then she has a nice afterword where she talks about after 50, which of course now is 30 years ago, uh, she began to feel the need to have a home for herself and to be less nomadic. And she writes that home is a symbol of self. Caring for a home is caring for oneself. She's still going strong. And then I just had to get in a little political. I am not endorsing anybody, not that anybody cares who I'm voting for, but. Um, she has some really interesting comments on Hillary Clinton because of her, you know, she's been covering politics for a long time. And she writes very nicely about her perceptions of the relationship between the Clintons um, and just Hillary's, Hillary's been a groundbreaking politician in, in many ways. So whatever you think of her now, whoever you're interested in now, the main message here, and Steinem says voting is only the beginning, it's not enough, but it's definitely the beginning. So I'm imagining most people here are registered to vote, but if you're not, I just got an email today from a Democratic organizer that the deadline to register is March 25th for the primary, and for once we may actually have a primary that means something, right? Okay, so I mentioned briefly that one of my criticisms was just that she jumps around a little bit and it was a little hard for me to know exactly when she was talking about sometime. Um, and I also thought she was maybe overly um, optimistic or positive about, she talks at one point about how the different factions of the women's movement came together, how the 
Um, you know, there's a lot of criticism of the second wave feminist movement as being white, middle, and upper middle class women and not really being inclusive. And I think those criticisms are justified. And I don't think she really acknowledges that as much as maybe she should have. But these are really um, fairly minor criticisms. Um, so in conclusion, I highly recommend the book. It's very readable. It's just really interesting. and. Um, you know, I lived through that time period as a kid and a young teenager, so for me it was really kind of filling in some gaps of my, of my time growing up. And um, if I can be as active and, you know, <laughs> make even a tenth of the contributions that Gloria Steinem has made by the time I'm 83, I will be very happy. So, thank you very much. So we have time, Rebecca, how much time do we have? About 10 minutes for questions? Yes. Um, the question is, is it true that she was involved with the CIA? If she was, she does not mention that in this book. So I have no idea. She may have been. I have no idea. So you, you talk about her honest reflection on her privilege. Mm -hmm. She's so attractive. Yeah, she and talked about that. Journalists could get away with being a playboy. Right, her. right. So does she address that part of she, her? She life? does, um, because I, I think she, um, I mean, I know I've had this problem my whole life too. It's so frustrating when people don't take you seriously. <laughs> um, <laughs> But she's, she's pretty honest about it. I think, I think it actually was frustrating to her. And part of it was the times. I mean, she talks about this one story when she was in a cab between two male journalists. And I forget who they were. Um, they're pretty well known, at least subsequently. And she says that um, one, she was sitting in between them. And then one man leaned over to the other and said, every summer there's a pretty new intern. This summer it's Gloria's. Gloria's a pretty new intern. She wasn't an intern. And she says in the book that she regretted that she didn't sort of jump out of the cab and protest. You know, she kind of laughed it off. Um, but I think sometimes when uh, those experiences happen, I mean, it's easy to think about later what you would have done, right? But at the moment, you're just kind of stunned. Um, but I think she, I wouldn't say she necessarily suffered for it, but I think it was something that she felt maybe got in the way. Um, I don't know how much her attractiveness enabled, you know, gave her access to, she doesn't talk so much about that. I mean, I, I think she was, the, what was interesting to me about reading it from, from the perspective of how she spent her time is she was just out every day learning about the world and trying to shed light on the kinds of injustices that were go are going on, you know, and um, I don't know, I'm 54 years old. The kind of energy she seems to have now, I'm just like, give me, bottle that up because I don't know how, she, I mean, she obviously takes so much sustenance from what she does. And I, I, I mean, I would love to meet her because I think she must have in a really engaging manner of, of being with people. And I think her listening approach is probably what does that. Gary. You, met, you mentioned, um you know, Hillary Clinton, and, and as you all know, that Steinem and, and Madeleine Albright made some comments at one, oh, of, yeah. <laughs> one of Clinton's, and, and they were like 60s, 70s type veterans, yeah. and they actually um, ended up, um, I don't know, insulting, turning off a lot of millennial women. Right, Is right. Is there any sense in the book that she, that she senses that the message may have changed, or her approach may have changed? Because there, there was, and I know you're aware, and I think others are too, there's a disconnect between yeah. uh, women under 30, maybe millennial women, and older women about what, what the role of women is and, and how they make decisions. Mm -hmm. Is there any sense in the book? She does. I don't think she... Had, yeah, I don't... The question is, is there any sense, does she talk at all in the book about sort of the third wave feminists or that sort of what younger women might take for granted? Um, she doesn't address that. I know she walked back those comments. I don't know if Madeline Albright did. I know Gloria was kind of like, whoa, shouldn't have said that. Um, I mean, it doesn't necessarily surprise me that uh, women who struggled so valiantly and changed so much 
might be upset that younger women who are benefiting, who don't, who just sort of take things for granted. I mean, that's probably what happens in lots of activist movements, that you struggle to get rights and recognition and, and to make life easier for future generations, and then when it's easier for them, they don't know it even happened. Um, so, you know, it, I think that's a kind of conundrum. Um, I mean, there was an interesting thing about Clinton, I, probably on NPR where I get all my news, um, that uh, younger women see her as their mother, so they're kind of turned off by that. I think, okay, but Bernie Sanders is their grandfather, so I mean, <laughs> I don't get that either. Um, so I don't know, but I think, you know, I actually don't, haven't decided who I'm voting for, um, except I know it's not a Republican. <laughs> Sorry if I offend anybody. Um, I think she, she gives a lot of good background information about Clinton and speaks about her, you know, kind of journalistically. So I think, I think um, if there's any aim to kind of educate an audience, it would be in that way. There was another question. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard that, yeah. It's, it's very good. And she does talk about that um, the absence of schooling. Mm -hmm. and basically, she said she could have got her early school books because they just put her in the back seat with books to read. Um, but I don't remember if it was from that interview with Terry or an article, but doesn't she also have a foundation now? She, um, she doesn't talk about the foundation, but I think I saw that on, on the website. And, yeah. And the foundation, it seemed to me, was very interested in um, minority women issues. So in, in some sense, I thought that that was a way of sort of getting past that, you know, the, the white women right. up, up middle or up middle right. class um, right. era of passionate. Well, I think one thing, I mean, this question or, or comment is about, you know, her foundation and, and what its aims are and, and that it's not just about white feminists or white women. Um, but this gentleman in the back was telling me, reminding me that uh, she was also on the, what's it called? Finding Your Roots? Find Yes, um, which Gary had told me and then I had completely forgotten about. Um, so she's, I think there's, there's, I mean, she could have written... 26 volume book. I mean, she, her life is fascinating. So I think um, hearing her speak in her own work in person or on, on video or audio would, would be even more interesting because there's just a lot she doesn't address. And I think, you know, in this book, she's taking this slice of kind of looking at her travels and the different ways that traveling has enabled her to become who she is. So there's a lot of other ways of looking at her life. Yeah. What I was struck by the book the most was her description of the Native American culture, yeah. which you just don't hear any place of. That was very enlightening. I think uh, it's one of the many kind of absences of that, you know, theoretically we call structuring absences, which is like Maya Angelou's playing in the dark, which is really that you know, the, the dominant white view of our whole society is just one slice that's blinder, that's just so limited. And I was really grateful that she included that last chapter where she talks about not just her friendship with Wilma Whitman Killer, but her appreciation of being brought in to Native American um, families. I mean, she really had a very deep and abiding friendship and uh, activist relationship as well. Sir. I'm not afraid to say who I'm voting for. Okay. <laughs> if I knew, I would say. I voted for Barack Obama, President Obama, and I'm very tired of people calling him Obama. Obama is like the, you know, makes the bill to say that name. Uh, I had no qualms about voting for Hillary Clinton, and I think it will be. Uh, sad case uh, in America if we don't all uh, uh, do the same. Because uh, women bring a very different perspective on just about everything. They're certainly not going to screw this country up as much as all of those idiot men. <laughs> now, see, I can't say that. <laughs> Thank you. But I will be there first thing on November uh, to vote for Hillary Clinton. Okay, well, thank you very much.
<laughs> Any other questions or comments? I think we're about to wrap up. Mm -hmm. One more. I think that's a great question, and, and uh, I was grateful for the timing of this event because I get to miss a three-hour meeting on campus right now. So I'm with you. Okay. Oh, thank you. If you could stay up here for. Oh sure. Yes. Oh.